The East Central Africa region has a country that really gives a strong emphasis on marathons. You see, the country of Kenya has produced many marathon winners. What's their secret? Why do they win so many medals? What is the source of their victory? You'll find out. the campus of the University of Eastern Africa Bariton in Kenya. It is early morning. Little by little, some of the best athletes of the country start coming. They warm up and start training. They always train as a group. They work and live as a family. Finally, it is time for the competition. Why do they run? How do they run? How is this competition related with family, commitment, and the mission of the church. Coaches, sponsors, track partners, Abel had them all, but he had something more, a Christian mother. I ran because it is a gift from God, because it is a talent and a talent is a gift. So when I realized that I am capable and I have the potential to run, then I, I choose it as the best career in my life. But she did a lot in my life when I was young, and she used to tell me, let us pray, she's a prayerful. I, I, I remember what my, what, what my mom said, that may you keep my children so that they will choose for themselves whom they are going to serve in their life. I know the greatest dream in my life is when I go anywhere and I have run and I have succeeded, I tell God, I have received the price of this world. What about now the eternal price? I used to ask my God, for sure I have a, like a, I get good money when I, when I win big race, I am comfortable, I have good LT, but LT can change, maybe tomorrow you are okay, tomorrow you are not, it's only the shelter of the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's only that my life has been all going very smooth, but then I say the greatest thing in my life is to receive everlasting life. Now famous, the boy returns to his origins as not to forget the most precious thing his mother gave to him, faith. Since you say, oh my God, uh, whoever uh, displaces me in the presence of men, I will have to show him also in my crown one time. So I told my Lord that uh, every time I finish, I should praise him. I should say, thank you, God. And the world is watching. That is what, what, what I am happy about myself. Because I finish, I say, thank you. I take my prayer and then I, I say, tell the world, it's only the power of God that is giving me all this strength. And the power of God led him to many desired positions in world marathon ranking. He's a two-time champion of the world marathon and won silver at the London Olympics. Uh, Jesus for me means a lot. I know it is foolishness for those who don't see the cross, but it is for those who need life. Uh, it's something with a great understanding. I know 
Jesus actually uh, bring me and he has brought me from very, very far away when I was in a very humble family. Uh, of course, uh, we, we found ourselves only with a mom, so, so life was a bit difficult and then I saw the hand of God. My mom was a Christian actually. He took us to Seventh-day Adventist Church all the time. He kept telling us in a, in a humble way, not pressing us, not using force for us to go to the church. She used to tell us kindly, let mama, let us go to church. However, the joy is of such great value only because he knows how painful the preparation is. Uh, it depends now on the strength of your mind. So pain is something that cannot kill you so long as you are healthy inside your body. So the pain is the pain. It's actually like when Jesus was carrying the, the cross, he was, very, he was in a very heavy pain. So he was like falling down, standing up, falling down. It was the pain uh, actually, which was the, like a terrible pain uh, uh, in marathon. It's like that. The pain is so, but we are sure we keep because you know the price. If you see you are number like number three, number four, you are still in the bracket of money. You need to go and finish unless you say, ah, I have finished it. <laughs> I am thankful because uh, first uh, I came to this world and uh, God has given me the, the power to achieve. And I have been raised from uh, Christ to Christ. I have been brought up from the, the family where nobody could have recognized even the village up to the where now I am. The world is say, hey, when I go to Nairobi one time, I didn't, I didn't think that the people know me in Nairobi. And they say, another boy say, this is Abel Kroon. The guy, he was running, he was running. As I knew, I got to go. I got to go to Foba. I moved to Foba and I got to go to the court. But as I got to go to the court, I got to go to the court. As I got to go to the court, I got to go to the court. Actually, the, 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 the feeling is that uh, in everything we do in the world, we know God is leading this. Championships winner Abel Kirui of Kenya is in the field. So me myself, when I, I pray God, when I'm in the like like uh, running 42 kilometers, it's not an easy task. But there is no pain in 20 kilometer, no pain in 21 kilometer, no no pain in 25 kilometer. But there is the pain in 35 kilometer. There is pain in 40 kilometer. There is pain in the last one kilometer. Absolutely incredible poetry in motion. So I used to ask God, may you give me the power to come and overcome and overcome. Then I see I conquer, then I say, oh, praise your, the, your name. He's running his own race, and he's run it quite magnificently. And he is the marathon champion, Abel Kirui. He takes gold for Kenya. Kenya, we now go to this region of Kajiado to find out a little more about the Maasai people. There are about one million people who belong to this ancient tribe between Kenya and northern Tanzania. The landscape is arid, without much greenery. In the distance, you can see one of many shepherds leading his flock. As nomads, the Maasai people follow the rain, the humidity, because the demand for cattle in this region is their greatest asset. There are efforts by the government for them to stop roaming about and focus on agricultural activities. There are also efforts aimed at putting an end to a very common ritual, performing clitoridectomies in girls as they enter puberty. 
These girls grow up in a culture where it is not common for women to attend school, to be independent and to decide for themselves. Jump. It's in this arid culture that a Seventh-day Adventist school has been making a difference. Uh, I came to work here because I love children and I have passion for girls. I came to work there as a teacher and a pastor. I grew up there and I had a passion to do girls ministry. This is a, we started as a rescue center where we rescue young Maasai girls who are married off a tender age. Because they were really oppressed by the culture. We had for many years we had never sent a girl to secondary school. Um, for us, I think it's fun. Um, because we are, we are playing here with the girls um, when we are coming in the night um, and we are joking with them here. These two young German girls left their country to serve as teachers at the school, contributing to the education of these children without offending them or trying to erase the local culture. It's a sensitive and important task. I'm teaching German and life skills. I'm a teacher for German and life skills. And we are spending time with the girls together. We are here like we are the big sisters for them, um, encourage them and helping them to grow. It's a shame to talk about it. When you are rescuing the girls, you might think that they are, they are sold uh, so expensive or maybe they cost a lot. But uh, mostly it is around between 10,000 and 20,000 shillings and around five cows. So to me, the girls are so precious, but it's like the parents take them to be so cheap. Because you can imagine a human being being sold for, <laughs> for like... 10,000 shillings and five cows, that is too cheap. Girls like Deborah can rewrite their own history. With the death of her mother when she was just a child, life became difficult with her father's five other wives. She was given in marriage at age eight to a man who was 80 years old. Here she found shelter, food, she studied, now is a teacher. I'm feeling so good and I thank God and I thank the, the well-wishers and those who supported me to get my education. I'm, I'm praise that God helped me in the future in some years to come back. I bet say and help also my sisters to get more education. Okay, there was one girl that came here. Her name is Blessing. I think she's only seven years old and we rescued her from early marriage. You are feeling like, well, I am 20. So I could be married off now and have, um, I don't know, four children. So I was really touched. She was so shy at the beginning. I couldn't imagine how somebody could do something to a little girl like this. Um, but after a few weeks, she was so, she was so um, changed. You are seeing the change. And she came to you, hugging you. She's smiling at you. She's running from the nursery to me. And saying, I love you and I miss you. And she just can't say miss. You. She means I miss you, but she just can say I miss you. And you know, it was so nice to see how she changed from the beginning to now.
school is also a change of life for these girls who would have never gotten an education were it not for the local Seventh-day Adventist school, which is a major challenge in that region that was embraced by another runner, Sammy. In my local church here, I have contributed to, to Pila Church. It's just uh, around one kilometer from here. And then I have some churches around here when they are doing a uh, rambi. the world but it's here next to his family that he considers himself truly a winner the money earned through his victories he uses here in this school for over 250 students in this area we did not have so many boarding schools people used to take their children to far places around 20 kilometers from here because when we are uh, sitting in hotels I am telling them, we share with them the word of God, and they are really happy, and they are saying, A place with enormous challenges and charming beauty. Landscapes that absolutely amaze us. Huge mountains such as Mount Kilimanjaro, which I happen to have climbed in the past, which leads us to think about the enduring values that are being destroyed every day, like its snow, which at one point was referred to as eternal, but in fact there's only 15% of it left. And nature teaches us in many different ways that it was created to stay, just like eternal values, like the family. Let's go together to a very natural retreat. 
where we see these values in a very striking way. Good. But now we have to wait just a little bit while the flock vacates the road since they arrived first. A dense forest, vegetation that's been well preserved, it's a haven for some 800 mountain gorillas in danger of extinction. Some of them live right here in this park in Rwanda. And the rest of them are divided between the countries of Congo and Uganda. We're here in the Volcan National Park of Rwanda up in the mountains. This is the natural setting of the mountain gorillas. It's absolutely incredible to watch them in their natural setting. It's phenomenal. The, when they are trying to build their chest or when they are breaking these bamboo trees, that shows us the, where, even where they were yesterday, we try to trace them up so that when tomorrow we come, if they were there, tomorrow we know that we are going to pass another way so that we can meet them. Okay, they do have walkie-talkie, we do have walkie-talkie. When we are down there, they do call us using walkie-talkie. Then we have the map of this forest in our heads. When they find them at the place, they say we are at this place, called like this, looking like this. Then we do bring people straight to the place. We do not need to pass where the gorillas have passed because uh, that can be a tearing walk. We use a shortcut to the gorillas. When I saw the gorillas for this first time, I felt intimidated. They are huge creatures, and they look a bit scary, but of course, again, they are so friendly, and you just have to accept the way they deal with us, and uh, before we left the place, I was very comfortable with them. Family is a key element in the lives of the gorillas, and they all obey the leadership of the father, also called the silverback, due to the characteristic marks on his back. It's absolutely amazing to see them as a family unit. They're always together. They're united. It's absolutely incredible. And as a family, the protective instinct speaks louder. And that's what happened when our crew came closer to them than they should have been, taking into account that the largest of these primates weighs up to 700 pounds and measures almost seven feet high as an adult. It was not comfortable waiting to see if he was really able to lift the two tons that biologists say he can lift. Uh, normally it's not dangerous. I'm, uh, for, uh, since the first time, for a bit with the gorillas, the sleep back come uh, charging. Huh? He's come to charging for you. You have uh, to, to, to uh, tell him who you are a friend. Huh? Especially when I had a newborn, I was very protective. And I noticed that when we spent too much time close to the mother with, this, with the eight-month-old baby, she was not real comfortable with that and did not stay still. She moved on. Uh, and I could understand that from the mother's perspective. But the whole family seemed so gentle. And that's what impressed me. They're massive, but they seem so gentle. And they didn't really seem annoyed, just, well, we'll move on a little bit and give you space. <laughs> well, there are a lot of interesting things that one can learn about leadership uh, watching the mountain gorillas. Uh, one aspect had to do, of course, with our guide, who was very careful in instructing us how to proceed. And if we followed his instructions, uh, things went very well. In terms of the family of gorillas themselves, uh, you could see that everything pretty much revolved around the silverback, the, the king as they call him, and uh, people took their cues from that, but it wasn't like he was forcing people this way or that, but a kind of a family atmosphere that proceeded in a, a, a certain direction that uh, was, was a kind of a common understanding. No matter what kind of culture you live in, certain principles will always be recognized as beneficial for a healthy development of relationships and accomplishments that could change millions of lives. Whether it's educating children, spreading the gospel, or rescuing innocence from hardship, 
into a better life, the core values that work as pillars for a well-functioning society are always the same. What can you do to improve the lives of those in need? How can you apply your skills, talents, and interests into actions that will give back to a less fortunate community? There's always something you can do. There is always something you can teach. And most importantly, there is always something you can learn from these experiences as you strengthen those values. Values. Eternal values. Next episode of Revival for Mission. Human depravity reached one of its all-time lows in the slave trade that ravaged Africa. Mirroring this unjust captivity, two Adventists were unjustly imprisoned in Togo. Despite the ugliness of human nature, God offers help, redemption, and a brighter future.